pleased that you've joined us for today's lecture. It's on a timely topic, a trillion dollars of student loans, a crisis created by Washington. That question is, in fact, being taken up just a couple of blocks from where the Kirby Center is located, as both houses of the United States Congress are considering whether to continue a lower rate of interest for a particular class of student loans. We have today with us an expert who's been writing not only on this particular uh, question uh, and uh, conducting a lot of scholarly research on this topic, but on questions attendant to the entire array of questions related to the financing of higher education. Uh, one uh, statistic, and I'm sure there will be many more in today's talk that I would like to uh, present to you, is, is uh, it relates to Hillsdale College. Uh, many of you might know that uh, the college is independent of any taxpayer funding, whether at the federal or state level. And we try to enable our students to graduate with as little uh, as, of, of debt as possible and, and through the contributions of, of friends from around the country, uh, private uh, loans and, and even more uh, private grants are available to students. But when it comes to paying back those debts, uh, Hillsdale College students do so at an extraordinary rate with a default rate uh, hovering uh, just over uh, 1%. Uh, that compares to a statistic much, much higher. I know that's been of some debate, and perhaps our speaker today will shed some light on that. To introduce our speaker, I'm going to call upon uh, Jim Dudley, uh, but before I do so, let me just make uh, two quick notes. One, uh, importantly, is that this lecture is brought uh, to you by the generosity of Chris and Sarah Chicola alumni of Hillsdale College. We are grateful to them for making this possible. Also, if you're watching this uh, on the webcast, you may send a question uh, that will be taken into consideration then uh, as part of our Q&A period, which will follow this lecture. You may do so by emailing us at firstfridays at hillsdale.edu. Today, to introduce our speaker formally is Jim Dudley for the last semester. Uh, Jim, a veteran of the United States Navy, a graduate of Villanova University, has been uh, doing yeoman work as intern with the Kirby Center. And I'm pleased to call on him now to introduce Professor Vetter. Richard Vetter is the Ruth Kennedy Distinguished Professor of Economics at Ohio University. He also serves as a senior fellow with the Independence Institute, as a faculty associate with the Contemporary History Institute, and as an adjunct scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. His books include Out of Work and Going Broke by Degree, Why College Costs Too Much. He also publishes regularly in the Wall Street Journal, the Christian Science Monitor, National Review, and Investor's Business Daily. Dr. Vetter received his PhD in economics the University of Illinois. Today, Dr. Vetter will be speaking on the topic, a trillion dollars of student loans, a crisis created by Washington. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Vetter. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I must say, uh, I'm delighted to be here today, although I'm somewhat surprised uh, because I am an economist, and economists are often wrong. Uh, uh, for example, uh, in writing in the New York Times in mid-October of 1929, the dean of American economists, Irving Fisher of Yale, said, and I quote Mr. Fisher, the stock market is on a permanently high plateau. It promptly began the biggest crash in American history, falling 85% over the next three years. In 1985, the Nobel Prize Keynesian economist of great reputation, Paul Samuelson of MIT, said in his iconic textbook, and I quote, the Soviet planning system is a powerful engine for economic growth. Seven years later, we had no Soviet Union, much less planning system, which has never was very powerful anyway ex at anything except causing misery. Uh, in 2009, the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, Christine Romer, opined 
that the Obama stimulus package, if it were passed, unemployment would never pass 8%. Uh, it promptly increased to 10% and is above 8% more than three years later. So you are now forewarned. In the <laughs> I am a longtime admirer of Hillsdale College. Uh, and I must say, however, in, in candor, that Hillsdale has given me a lot of headaches over the years, but for a very good reason. My research center, the Center for College Affordability and Productivities, does the rankings of undergraduate colleges for Forbes magazine. Uh, and, and Hillsdale has ranked very highly in those rankings, by the way. But unique among the 650 schools we look at, Hillsdale does not report a wide variety of data to the United States Department of Education because it has taken the principled stand that it wants to have as few dealings with the federal government as possible. Uh, th that stand has, I think, served the college well over the years, but nonetheless, we're always trolling for Hillsdale uh, data. I regret to say that we may be forced to drop Hillsdale from the rankings this year. I'm getting a lot of pressure to do so because of the difficulties. Uh, we've had to sort of guess at, guess at some of the data, and this is causing consternation among my, some of my colleagues. Today, though, I want to talk about the federal student f uh, financial aid program. Uh, programs, I really should say. I believe they are costly, inefficient, Byzantine, do not serve their desired objectives, and in one word, are dysfunctional. I used that term to describe them when I was serving on the Spellings Commission on the Future of Higher Education, and that raised quite a bit of fuss. If anything, these policies have moved from being dysfunctional to being uber dysfunctional, uh, amongst the worst of many bad federal programs. Federal student assistance programs can be rationalized on three grounds. First, it's argued that higher education has enormous positive spillover effects. Uh, where, uh, when Johnny or Joanne goes to college, their family, their friends, their coworkers, and so forth derive positive benefits from their attending. Second, it is argued that higher education is a vehicle to promote equal economic opportunity, a ticket to achieving the American dream. In short, it promotes income equality and mobility. Third, with respect to federal student loans, it is argued that markets for loans uh, for, to college students are imperfect, private markets are imperfect because of a lack of knowledge on the part of lenders about students and uh, in the absence of federal student loan programs, uh, too few students would be going to college. This is an argument often made. Now, I think all of these arguments are dubious at best. The alleged positive external benefits to college are very difficult to measure. And as the late uh, Milton Friedman opined to me shortly before his death, may be more offset by negative externalities or spillover effects. Uh, I have, he actually, Friedman asked, wondered whether we should tax colleges rather than subsidize them. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how Hillsdale would take to that. Uh, I have tried to uh, measure the economic uh, spillover effects by looking at the relationship between spending on higher ed and the rate of economic growth, uh, looking at state appropriations for each of the states that uh, have state universities. Uh, and what I have found is uh, that it, if you would expect if there were positive spillover effects, you would have higher economic growth the more you spend on colleges. I found the reverse. The more uh, state appropriations go up, the lower the rate of economic growth, or at, or at, at, at the minimum, it's a, a non-existent relationship. So as to higher ed, as higher education, uh, and uh, the, the, by inference, student loan programs of, as a vehicle for income equality. I think it's interesting that over the last four de decades in which the proportion of adults with four-year college uh, degrees tripled, that income equality in the United States fell, not rose. 
Looking at this issue in elaborate detail with a colleague, Daniel Bennett, we're finding that if in small doses, higher education might have some egalitarian features, but at the level it operates in America today, higher education actually tends to induce reduction in income equality. Now, personally, I don't know what the socially optimal level of inequality is or equality, and the tacit assumption that more equality is desirable, I think, is at least questionable. Uh, but that isn't germane to our discussion today. In reality, higher education is not promoting income equality. A smaller percentage of low-income Americans who are recent college graduates, a small, smaller percentage come from the lower-income cl uh, classes today than in 1970, before we had Pell Grants or much of a student loan program. Uh, so it, it, these programs have done nothing to help the poor, at least I, as I read it. With regards to that imperfect capital market about student loans, capital markets argument, I think it is likewise very weak. Every college student I know has had no problem acquiring credit cards. If financial institutions can issue can lend on credit cards to college students without any difficulty and make car loans to college students readily and in large numbers, why can't they make student educational loans perfectly adequately on their own? I think the short answer is they can. Thus, I think the intellectual arguments for these programs are very, very weak. That said, however, these programs exist and are growing rapidly. The Pell Grant program well over doubled in size between 2007 and 2010. Designed to help poor people, the Obama administration is working hard to make it a middle class entitlement. Student loans have been growing eight to 10% a year for at least two decades and is well publicized, uh, now aggregate to $1 trillion of debt outstanding, roughly $25,000 or so on average for the roughly 40 million holders of that debt. Student loan debt is now larger than credit card debt in the United States. I have always assumed that this debt was mostly held by young people in their 20s or at the most early 30s, but new Federal Reserve data show that that isn't the case. The median age of those with loan obligations today is about 33, and about 40% of the debt is held by persons 40 years of age or older. So when the president and even Governor Romney talk about maintaining low interest rate loans, these 3.4% loans, this is not helping kids in college as much as older middle-aged in individuals long gone from the halls of the academy. Now let me outline 10 specific problems I have with federal student loan programs, or grant, in some cases, grant programs. There are undoubtedly others, but this is uh, going to be an, is an afternoon talk, a lunch talk soon, and you want lunch and diminishing returns and sleep will set in if I give you more than 10 points. <laughs> the law of diminishing returns. First, student loan uh, interest rates are not set by the forces of demand and supply, but rather by the political process. Interest rates are a price used to allocate scarce resources, and when that price is manipulated by politicians, it leads to distortion in the use of those resources. Since student loan interest rates are always set below market rates, in this case it means that too much money is borrowed for college given the innate preferences of borrowers and lenders. At the moment, these interest rates, some of them are extremely low, with a key rate being 3.4%, which after adjusting for inflation is approximately zero. Moreover, both the President and Governor Romney want to continue that low interest rate after July 1, when it is supposed to double. This is going to aggravate an already bad problem and a perfect example of a fundamental problem with representative democracy. I love representative democracy, by the way, but it does have its problems. And the problem here is that politicians will push programs where the benefits are visible and immediate, at least to them, uh, even though the costs are extraordinarily high 
uh, but relatively less visible and not apparent for several years. That is, this, the problem is about three blocks away. It's not here <laughs> on Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, Constitution Avenue and Independence Avenue and in between, yes. Second, this is not the only variation from the real world of credit markets. In the real world, interest rates vary with the prospect that the borrower will repay the loan. Uh, in the surreal world of student loans, the brilliant student completing an electrical engineering degree at MIT pays the same interest rate as the kid majoring in ethnic studies at Chicago State University who has a GPA below 2.0 and has already flunked several courses. The MIT student almost certainly will graduate and get a good job, probably paying at least $50,000 a year, whereas the odds are very high that the Chicago State student will fail to graduate and will be lucky to be making $30,000 a year. Related to this, colleges themselves have no skid in the game. They are responsible for allowing loan commitments to occur, but when defaults are extremely high, imposing costs on the taxpayers, the colleges who are at least partially responsible for the default face no penalties or negative consequences. That's something Congress could remedy pretty easily, by the way. Third, and arguably the most important point, the federal grant and student loan programs have contributed to the tuition price explosion in the United States. When third parties pay a large part of the bill, at least temporarily, the customer's demand for the service rises and he or she is not terribly sensitive to price. Universities and colleges take advantage of that and raise their prices to capture the, loan, the funds that are ostensibly designed to help students this is actually what happened in healthcare and is what is happening in higher education. Bill Bennett loudly observed this positive relationship between tuition fees and federal student loans 25 years ago when he was the education secretary and the relationship which is now called the Bennett hypothesis is as true now as it was then. I talked to Mr. Bennett about it the other day. He still believes that. Fourth, there is only a monopoly provider of student loans, the federal government. Till recently, at least the feds turned the servicing of loans over to a variety of private financial service firms, adding an element of competition and leading these private providers to buy for business on the basis of the quality of the service, if not the price. But the Obama administration, with its strong hostility to private enterprise, has now decided to exercise a complete monopoly. The post office can't deliver the mail cheaply, efficiently, or profitably. The division of motor vehicles in any state government is notoriously inefficient, with long lines and nasty employees servicing customers. Why should the federal government monopoly be any different with respect to student loans? By the way, because of highly irresponsible fiscal policies, remember the federal government borrows 30 or 40 percent of the money it spends. At the margin, the student loan program is arguably financed by government borrowing, much from overseas. Thus, we are incurring long-term obligation to foreigners to finance loans to largely middle-class Americans to go to college. Is this an appropriate use of public funds at a time of significant federal budget deficits? Fifth, those applying for student loans or Pell Grants are compelled to complete the FAFSA form. This is a problem on multiple levels. First of all, the form throughout most of its history has been extremely complex, comprising more than 100 questions. My wife, a longtime high school guidance counselor in a very poor area, has long told me that the single greatest obstacle to getting poor kids into college was the fact that most of the students' parents simply refused to fill out the FAFSA form. Secondary, second, uh, in a secondary uh, point, is that the form is also used by colleges to administer so-called scholarships. 
That is to say, tuition discounts given to some students, but not to others. Thus, colleges are given all sorts of highly personal and private information on family incomes, wealth, debt, child support, and so forth. Uh, imagine going to a car dealer and asking how much a car costs, only to be told that you will get that information only after you tell the dealer all sorts of personal financial information that then will enable the dealer to see how much he can gouge you given your financial situation. That car dealer would either be out of business or in jail within days or weeks. This is commonplace in higher education and exists because of the so-called federal student financial assistance programs. This brings me to a related uh, sixth point, partly because of the validity of the Bennett hypothesis, partly because of the impact of the FAFSA form in reducing applications of low-income uh, persons for college aid, and no doubt for other reasons relating to the fact that many colleges gauge success partly on the basis of the number of customers they turn away, uh, the relationship between college degree attainment and income equality these days is in fact negative. The larger proportion of adults with college degrees in a state, the higher the degree of income inequality in the state. Uh, and I think student loans have had a role to play in this. Seventh, the federal programs have been successful in increasing the number of students who enroll in college. No doubt about that, more kids go to college. But that has led to two big problems. First, the number of college graduates annually now far exceeds the number of new managerial, technical, and professional jobs. Jobs uh, that traditionally went to college graduates after uh, they finished school. One survey by Northeastern University estimates that over half of recent college uh, graduates are underemployed or unemployed, or as one of these individuals put it in an email to me recently, malemployed, a term I rather like. I, went, I wanted to hire that kid on the, on the spot for the, coming up with that term. We are now in a world with 107,000, uh, I was asked to use some statistics, so here they are. We're now in a world with 107,000 janitors with bachelor's degrees, not to mention over 16,000 parking lot attendants. Do you really need a bachelor's degree to be a bartender, hairdresser, or mail carrier? Lots of persons in these occupations have such degrees, and many of them are struggling to pay off their loan obligations with their very limited incomes. Although the mail carriers do pretty well, which is one reason why the post office is going broke. <laughs> the second huge uh, problem that enrollment increases induced by federal student loan programs have caused relates to academic quality. More and more kids are going to college who lack the cognitive skills, the discipline, the academic preparation, and or the ambition to succeed academically. They simply cannot or do not master well much of the co rather complex materials that college students are expected to learn. The consequences of this are twofold. First, a lot of these students either do not graduate or fail to graduate on time. I have estimated that only 40% or less of Pell Grant recipients actually get degrees within six years. An extremely high dropout or failure rate. No one has seriously questioned that statistic, a number, by the way, that the federal government does not publish, uh, no doubt because it's embarrassingly low. Second, in an attempt to minimize this problem, colleges have lowered standards, expecting students to read and write less, giving higher grades than true historically for lesser amounts of work. Surveys show students spend on average less than 30 hours a week on all aspects of academic work, less than they spend on recreation. You know what recreation is to college students. Uh, at, but this is a family television show, a presentation. As Arum and Roska showed in Academically Adrift, critical thinking skills amongst college seniors on average are embarrassing little more than among freshmen. 
The eighth problem with student loans was suggested to me a couple of days ago by a North Carolina judge who wrote me and who shared a news story relating to a case in his courtroom about student loan fraud. With super low interest rates, there's a huge temptation for persons to pretend to have an interest in higher education, acquire a 3.4% loan, drop out of school quickly, and use the proceeds for other purposes, such as in the North Carolina case, starting a t-shirt business. Uh, this gives uh, those misusing student loans an unfair competitive advantage over others who have to borrow at market interest rates. Ninth, one of my students suggested to me that there's big money to be made in the markets for something called student loan asset-based securities, or I love this, slabs. <laughs> uh, the implication being that the government protection against default allows speculators in bundled loan packages to make huge profits. I haven't researched this in detail, but I can see where it might lead to undesirable, unintended uh, consequences. Tenth, poor and mediocre students can get greater subsidies than hardworking and industrious ones. Take the Pell Grants. A student who works extra hard and graduates with great grades after only three years will only get half as much money as the mediocre student who flunks several courses and takes six years and maybe doesn't even finish her degree. There are actually disincentives to excel academically. Okay, what do we do about all this? It is clear that the current system needs to undergo radical change. The simplest solution would be to simply eliminate all federal student loans and grant programs almost overnight. But aside from being totally infeasible from a political perspective, there are some legitimate equity issues that this would raise. For example, a student depending on federally subsidized loans to finance her college education would likely be in a sad situation if those loans were suddenly uh, uh, dried up. Uh, at, at the minimum, students in the loan, uh, in the grant and loan pipeline should arguably be allowed to finish their studies with continued financial support. A variant would be to grandfather existing recipients and to deny aid to future uh, potential students. But even here, however, one would hear cries of, I had prepared for college thinking I would be receiving a student loan that is no longer available. Nonetheless, this would be a better solution than what we have now. The justification for federal subsidies relating to issues of access, equality, and positive spillover effects seem to be empirically wanting. The federal government is vastly overextended uh, fiscally. Thus, a relatively rapid but humane phasing out of the programs would seem highly desirable. I'm speaking mainly about the loan, student loan programs here. There's a, a, a slightly different arguments can be made with respect to Pell Grants, but since I, the emphasis today is on student loans. I would point out in the era before these programs were large, say the 1950s and 1960s, higher education was in its golden age. Enrollments were rising, lower incomes, uh, a, a student access was actually growing, and American leadership in higher education became well established. We flourished without these kinds of programs. Much of the vast funding increase has contributed to an unproductive academic arms race that has led to bloated university bureaucracies, to higher costs of schooling, and probably to some significant decline in academic quality. If the law of, uh, of unintended consequences ever applied, it is in federal student financial assistance. Programs created often with the, the noblest of intentions have failed to serve their customers or the nation well. There are compromise measures that would sharply reduce the size of these programs and improve their functionality, but if past experience is any guide, Congress, to gain political points with some constituency, would likely ultimately re restore them to their dysfunctional current role. As the ratio of debt to GDP uh, continues to rise nationally and higher education continues to spend inordinately on unsustainably uh, uh, long, uh, at a long-term pace, radical change will come to the academy. 
The current situation is unsustainable economically. But and reforming federal financial aid policies would be a good place to start that reform. Thank you very much. We now have time for a few questions. So we have a couple microphones. We just ask that you raise your hand and wait for one of them to come to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear uh, Austrian economics being said, and, and I'm curious to know, are you being allowed to say this kind of thing on campuses? Are you being invited uh, three blocks away to the, the halls of power to, to say this where, where you can drive it home? Well, that is a most interesting question. I have been teaching for 47 years, and tenure has a lot of inefficiencies associated with it, but it has advantages. Retirement even adds to that. I can say anything I darn well want to anyone <laughs> and do. I used to, I, I must say, in fairness, I received a call from a congressman. In fact, a congressman wanted me to come over and see him before this lecture. I couldn't go because of time constraints. Uh, I've agreed to meet with him next week. Uh, I have, there are, I've talked to several congressmen, uh, Congressman Ryan and I have had some interesting conversations on these issues, and he's kind of a thoughtful, long-run kind of guy, I think, and he may have uh, some interesting, uh, I think he's willing to, is open to new ways of dealing with this problem. So there is some of this. In the academy, uh, I give a lot of talks uh, to different schools. I've been at it, uh, such uh, schools as University of Vermont, University of Wisconsin in recent weeks, Dartmouth College, Princeton University. I'm going to UCLA next month, in, or in about two weeks, although that's a group of libertarians inviting me out there. I, I say a group, probably three, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 that are inviting me out. So I have, uh, to be fair, but there is a lot of problems in the academy with sort of intimidation and intolerance against unpopular ideas, and I face that some. I was, uh, I, I needed, I have needed police protection on two times where I've had to speak. I'm serious about this. I've actually had to have uh, police protection. Once I was uh, uh, supporting sweatshops, I think they're rather nice, uh, at the University of Michigan, and that didn't go over well. And, uh, and I had a group of African-American uh, scholars mad at me because I questioned whether we should continue to have historically black colleges and universities based on race. I mean, I, I'm not against the institutions, but basing a, a, an institution on its racial composition, I question whether that is, is an outmoded concept. So I get a lot of hostility from time to time, but look at, uh, if this is a free country and we believe in the First Amendment and we believe in free ideas and we believe in representative democracy, if not me, who? And if not now, when? <laughs> Uh, professor, uh, the administration and others uh, frequently point the finger at private profit-making institutions as being the major leader in default. Um, do you find this a, a major problem? It it it, it is. Uh, there's a lot of disin there's a lot of disingenuous use of statistics here. It is true that loan default rates amongst those who go to the so-called for-profit universities are somewhat higher than the default rates among other schools. Although I would add a majority of defaults, a large majority of defaults, occur in traditional not-for-profit institutions. But you have to remember the for-profit institutions also serve an entirely different kind of clientele than the typical college and universities. A vast majority of the students in many of these for-profit schools are non-traditional students, first-generation college students, uh, members of minority groups, and so forth, uh, groups for which uh, default rates have historically been high. Uh, the the for-profit schools have taken advantage of these programs like anyone else, but I think the, the hostility towards profit and for-profit institutions is almost pathologically unsound, 
And uh, I have been a strong supporter of these institutions. By the way, on average, my opinion is these institutions are more student-centered. The two groups in America of, in higher ed that are student-centered are the traditional not-for-profit liberal arts colleges, of which Hillsdale is a marvelous example. I've visited Hillsdale on uh, more than one occasion. And the other group are the for-profit schools, because Students are their bread and butter. That's how they make money. They gotta be nice to students. They gotta serve students. They gotta help them get jobs after they graduate. So I think they've taken a kind of a bell rap. Question is gonna come from someone in our online audience. It's Robin Hole, and she asks, it seems to me that the right to education is part of the problem insofar as it means that everyone should go to college. Uh, is there such a right? Well, I don't know, it, I don't recall in the Bible or in the Founding Fathers any talk about the right to a Pell Grant. Uh, no one knew who Pell was then. Uh, for whom does the Pell toll? Uh, 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 so uh, I don't think, people manufacture rights all the time to this and to that, and this is another one of these. Uh, attempts to expand entitlement programs uh, by creating a right. Uh, it, it's arguable that there, there's a right of people to live uh, a, a good life and to live free uh, without interference. There's arguably a life that government, you could make an argument that government can maybe push that along in some cases, I suppose. But I don't see any particular right here. I actually see uh, that we have created this horrible problem, as I say, of, 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 of causing great disappointment and, and among young people, a great disillusionment of young people. We, we entice them to go to college. President Obama used the term imperative the other day. The, the Gates Foundation has used similar language. The Illumina Foundation has used similar language. I'm not, never gonna get money from any of these people again. I did in one case before. Uh, I think it's, wrong to say these things to kids. You must go to college. Uh, should most p students after they graduate from high school have some training that would prepare them for some sort of job? I guess the answer to that is yes. Sometimes that training comes on the job itself. Sometimes that training comes from going to a truck driving school for a year and getting a certificate or becoming an apprentice to become a plumber. What's wrong with being a plumber? Is there anything wrong with being a plumber? We can't all be college professors, thank God. <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, I, I always agreed with the late Bill Buckley who said he'd rather be governed by the first hundred names in the Boston Telephone Directory than the faculty at Harvard College. And, and I uh, think that applies today. Although telephone directories are going by the wayside, I notice. <laughs> Yes, well, uh, and people answering, are running the mic, so right. there are several questions up here. Uh, sir, uh, early in your presentation, you discussed the demographics of who owes this money. Yeah. And have you done any analysis of that group, which appears to be in the 30 and 40 year old uh, contingent, so to speak? Uh, those people who took up education college education later in their life or people who have just refused to pay I, it back? I, that's a wonderful question and I don't know the answer. This Federal Reserve, I think there are people that are looking into that a lot. One group that has ro rolled up a huge percentage of the debt are these uh, and you know $100,000, $150,000 loans to professional people, uh, lawyers and doctors. And you know, you don't even finish getting through school, in some cases, till you're 30 years old or older. So I could see if a, a person graduates with a law degree with $150,000 debt, and I know one such person who's now in her mid-30s making $55,000 as an assistant prosecutor and paying 150,000 in debt. It takes a long time to pay off a debt at that rate. By the way, the president has also said, well, after so many years, we're gonna forgive the rest of the debt. And you only all have to pay 10% of your income. And you put in provisions like that, which is a step in the direction of forgiveness. And if we move to student loan forgiveness, we will go the same way as Greece, uh, as a nation. Uh, and uh, we will, if we don't ultimately default, 
we will be in a real tough time. And we're sending a very, very bad message. I think the Occupy Wall Street people have talked about, let's forgive student debts. Sounds nice, doesn't it? Sounds nice. Um, I, I, I said in an article it was the second worst idea ever. And so the person I was asked what was the worst idea. I said creating the loan programs in the first place. <laughs> uh, and it, 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 it would cause every student in America to borrow who just ignore repayment as, uh, because they say, you know, we, they're repaying it for some group, why not for us? And, and, and the whole, and no one, and it would be just one federal big lo giveaway. You know, you can borrow any amount of money. There are limits to how much you can borrow under various programs, but you can borrow an awful lot of money under these programs. Uh, and that was another thing. I didn't even mention this, my uh, say, why not put a limit on how much you can borrow? 5,000 a year, 6,000 a year. We're pushing kids to apply, kids, some of them who are not anywhere near qualified to go to Harvard. Oh, I want to go to expensive school, you know, Yuppie U1 is 40,000 a year, as opposed to the community college or, or the, uh, the local uh, state university, which might be eight or 9,000 a year. And uh, yeah, I, I love private liberal arts colleges, but uh, is it really the federal government's role to pay for Cadillac education uh, for everyone? Uh, to to what Someone's got a, the micro, there's a microphone right. issue here. Get this gentleman later, though. He's been trying hard to get in. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, to what extent uh, does the problem you have outlined today uh, contribute to the decline of technical schools around the country uh, for a variety of reasons owing to rising labor costs in China and the discovery that we sit at atop abundant uh, resources of natural gas, which means cheaper electricity, manufacturing in the United States is making a comeback or is on the cusp of making a huge comeback. But the problem that the manufacturers discover is lack of skilled labor because we have been herding kids off to college to study uh, criminal justice, which I guess is the ultimate oxymoron, and, and we don't have people who are qualified uh, to take on jobs of responsibilities in uh, manufacturing plants. So could you please address that? Thank you. Yeah, yes, we don't. Tool and die workers, for example, or specialized uh, uh, manufacturing type jobs or production type jobs, we, uh, the average age among those who are still in those fields is getting very, very high. It's getting almost as old as the average philosophy professor. Uh, uh, and the, uh, there is a problem there. And I, the, I never thought I would say this on, in an audience for Hillsdale College. The Germans do one thing fairly well, and that is they do have fairly decent vocational uh, uh, programs. Uh, and they don't look at college as the, where the good people go, the elite, the successful people go to college. Other people go to vocational training after high school or even in the latter part of the high school years, that what we would consider junior and senior. We used to have vocational schools in this country. We still have some, but they have been sort of in disrepair. Or dis, uh, and I think they need to be revived. I think we need to put more emphasis on that. I think the government should give a lot of vouchers out, not, uh, not sponsor schools, but give vouchers, let young adults, uh, uh, perhaps high school graduates, go where they want to get some specialized skill training. We do need people to drive those 18-wheel trucks down the highway. We need uh, uh, plumbers. We need tooling die makers. All of these things require some skill, some training, but they don't require formal uh, four-year uh, uh, college educations, and we should prepare for those uh, people as well. And we've been neglectful of that audience, I think. A little bit of irony here is Hillsdale College students, are they, is any of the federal programs available to them? I'm not, uh, I don't want to represent uh, Hillsdale College here, and I would defer to the Hillsdale uh, 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 staff on whether, uh, the, what, what they're allowed to do or not do. But I know that Hillsdale as an institution has since its founding way back in the 19th century not taken any federal money. Am I, uh, I hope I'm, 
uh, no one is disagreeing me for, who represents Hillsdale here. I cannot speak with specific, uh, one thing students can do, you know, students can borrow, there was nothing wrong with a student borrowing money from a bank. That's not illegal now. Uh, you don't get put in jail if you go to the bank and borrow. And a lot of students borrow, they tell me this, I think it's an inefficient way to borrow, they just, <laughs> they take their credit cards out. They, they finance college on their credit card. Now, is that efficient? Maybe not. And I'm sure there's kids at Hillsdale that do that as well. So I'm sure there's some, some private, there, there's uh, students at Hillsdale with debt, but uh, I don't think the, uh, the administration at Hillsdale is pushing hard for uh, students to borrow money uh, from the federal government. I don't know what the specifics are on that. Yes, sir. Well. Well, and that's right. The default, incidentally, there's a big argument about the magnitude of the defaults, and there is some evidence that the federal government defines faults in a default in a way that would not pass snuff with um, in the private sector in financial institutions. It's true in the ultimate analysis, there the federal taxpayers, the taxpayers are picking up the bill. In a default, it is true that if, if a student uh, pays half of their loan back and then doesn't pay the other half back because they uh, if defaulted, they've gone into bankruptcy or whatever, the, the government is getting something out of it. If we just forgive everyone, uh, uh, Warren Buffett's grandchildren, if he has any on student loans, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, paying anything back, we have a highly inefficient system where we're, we're giving money out to uh, higher income people. I know, I know some fairly affluent kids that borrow money. Their parents say, I have told them, all right, we've told our kids to borrow money at 3.4 because we can't borrow at that. And so they tell their kids to borrow money at 3.4. I've had kids come up to me and they say, well, I take some of my, I've used some of my student loan money to start businesses and all this. It's, it's against the law. It's fraudulent. It happens all the time. I wish we knew the magnitudes of some of those things. We have an additional question from Doug Gorse, an online viewer. He said, our local high school claims their goal is to get all of their graduates into a college. It seems a lot of high schools in, in the region have this same goal. Why is this attitude so prevalent among our educators? Well, the, the holy grail is college. Uh, it, uh, if you... Americans have been led to believe that college is the path to success. So high schools, high school principals will say, we want every one of our kids to be a successful participant in the American dream. It's a noble uh, thought and a noble objective, I think. Uh, the, the reality, it, I th think it, it is th that it, 40, 50 years ago, this uh, goal would have had resonated a little better because we didn't have this problem of malemployment of college graduates to the extent that we do today. Uh, and the goal would have been more meaningful. Uh, I think it, it, it is uh, not imperative that every student after high school do anything. I think that's an individual choice, individual freedom should prevail. And I don't know that the government should be telling people what to do or even high school principals and superintendents, but I do think, you know, it is probably true that most persons after they graduate from high school should do something to prepare themselves for the job world, because, particularly given the wretched state of secondary education in the United States. But uh, that's a far away, a far different thing than saying we want everyone to go to college. Yeah, Dr. Vedder, my name is Bruce Bennett. I'm from Fairfax County, Virginia. And you might imagine, I don't have any kids in the uh, local schools there. Uh, however, I became an, interested in this whole business of education and cost when I was, our school district was redistricted. And uh, I think it's, a, it's, it's an effort, or I'm confident it's an effort by the school administration to kind of homogenize our students to create a fictitious uh, level of 
attainment by those students to chase federal money. And I think, I think over the last 20 years, we've seen a, a kind of a destruction of our, of our schools, our public schools. And I'd like to have you comment on that. Yes, actually, that fits in well with, there's a, a uh, sociologist at uh, Rutgers, I usually don't think much of sociologists, this is one I like. I probably like him because he got his PhD in 1951 from Harvard and he's still going strong at the age of, I don't know, 120, whatever he is. <laughs> uh, his name's Jackson Toby. He wrote a book uh, a year or two ago and the, his central thesis was that the uh, lowering of emission standards and so forth by colleges, that is, kids can get in somewhere to college has led the high schools to lower their standards and you know kids will push hard in high school if the consequences of not succeeding is they can't achieve their next goal in life and that the colleges have contributed to the uh, problems in the in the public schools I think the public school problems go deeper than that I think there's a lot of problems uh, uh, certification standards are wrong the unions have too much power uh, education colleges. I, by the way, if it were up to me, I would make it. I, I don't like to make too many crimes because I'm fairly libertarian in orientation. But I think I would make it a, a felony for a superintendent of schools to knowingly hire a graduate of a college of education. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I'm joking a little bit, but only a little bit. We should do away with colleges of education. And uh, the, the, it is true, that, and, and I will say this as a college professor, some of the problems we have in colleges, we inherit. We inherit from the K through 12. I, the kids that are coming in, I've been teaching for 47 years. I give essay exams. I do all sorts of unfashionable things um, I, I, where you fill out blue books. And uh, the, the quality of the writing has deteriorated a lot over time, for example. Just to pick one thing. I used to assign six books in my course in American Economic History as required. I assign one now, and I pray that they read it. Uh, and you say that's my fault. I still have pretty tough grading standards. I thought that would drive the students away. For some reason, they keep coming to my class. I have, uh, this is the only example of market failure I've ever seen. Uh, uh, and uh, But uh, I really... I'm, I worry a lot about qualitative decline in, in, in our youth. Uh, they certainly have lost sight of the, the core values. They don't know about the founding of our country. They don't know history well enough. They don't know uh, a lot of those things. They're very good at, they're, they're okay, they're, their math skills are, haven't declined as much as their skills in other areas. Uh, but this lecture is supposed to be about student loans, not about that, so perhaps I, should be quiet. Uh. Sir, how you doing? Uh, thank you for the presentation today. Uh, obviously, this is a multifaceted problem uh, with the loan debt issue with students. Uh, but I think the magnitude of the problem perhaps is partly related to the lack of cost control on behalf of the universities. Have you looked at that, and do you have some interesting ideas on what universities could do to, to help lower the cost of education, which would in turn lower the cost of you know, these student loans for both the government and, and the people paying them? Oh, I love that question. I wrote a, I have a little pamphlet, I didn't bring any copies with me, called 25 Ways to Reduce College Costs. Let's just mention a few. Uh, um, let's start with something elementary, like buildings. You go to, General Motors, or you go to Microsoft or Intel, the buildings are occupied. You go there Fridays, the buildings are occupied. You go there in July, the buildings are occupied. You go into a typical university, four months a year, the most classrooms are empty. Most offices are empty all the time. Uh, my department, I, I've been doing a survey lately, and on average, 15% of the offices are occupied at any moment of time. So there's enormous space waste. I talked to a for-profit entrepreneur, uh, it, higher education guy about it, he says, we don't even own buildings. We're not in the real estate business, we're in the education business. We lease buildings, and that way we have greater flexibility, we can expand space, reduce space as we need. So there's enormous say, waste on the capital cost side. Teaching loads. Teaching loads, when I started teaching at a typical mid-quality state university were nine to 12 hours a week, 12 hours a week, 
uh, being quite common. Uh, now at those schools, they've fallen by a third to a half, and they have at the quality, at the University of Wisconsin, where I was, as I mentioned the other day, the standard teaching load for a full professor in economics, or anyone in economics, is one course a year. Uh, not a semester, a year. They got it down from one a semester. One a semester is more common. Two a semester is considered a brutal load. Uh, I taught three courses a semester when I started teaching on the semester system, managed to polish out a few books and, uh, I don't know, 150 articles. I, I worked hard. You know, I went to, I kind of looked at it like normal people. Go to work at 8.30, go home at 5, 5.30. Work a little bit on the weekends, work in the summer, a novel idea. And uh, I think that the, 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 the work ethic is, is a little low. Besides, a huge amount of work in, among college professors is unproductive research work that should never be published. It's, it's the law of diminishing returns is said. How many articles have been written on William Shakespeare since 1985? There's been, a gap, there's been a debate whether the number is as low as 21,000 or as high as 35,000. And I had the audacity at a meeting the other day to say, don't we know everything we need to know about the Bard? Uh, or are we reaching diminishing returns, anyway, in the studying of the Bard? I love Shakespeare, but he died in 1615. And the time has come maybe to only have 50 articles a year on Shakespeare. And uh, God was I eaten alive. Uh, so there are lots of things like this. The administrative staffs at universities have become incredibly bloated. A typical university has as many administrators as it does faculty members. Uh, and schools like Hillsdale probably avoid some of it because they don't have to deal with the federal government. So they, they cut out some of that. But there's just enormous, my university has a sustainability coordinator, whatever that is. We have a recycling coordinator, whatever that is. Uh, and do you really need to hire a lot of people to sit around and tell about Bonneville Earth and uh, why we should buy our vegetables locally rather than uh, in an efficient way at Kroger's, uh, made some cases in other countries. Uh, you know, we pay people to proselytize this junk. Uh, this, this unsounds, and th this is true all over, throughout, I may, probably not at Hillsdale, but it's true at most schools. And um, there's a lot of wastage, just a lot. Uh, I could go on and on. Really, do libraries need to buy? I love books. I have a huge library. But this pains me to say, but do libraries need to buy 50,000, 100,000 volumes a year anymore? A lot of them are being digitized, put on uh, by Google and others. Um, can't we have central libraries where you can go to get your books? Can't you have cooperative library associations? There's some of this going on in higher ed, by the way. I don't want to say there's none of this kind of activity going on, but there's just so many ways we could save money. I, I, I often say, I once said, give me the faculty, make me president of my university for one month, g cut my teaching load in half, <laughs> for that month, let me work half day in the president's office, half day in my office, and I will save $20 million by the end of the month. I, and, and, and one other thing, give me a copy of the phone directory. I'll just go through with a yellow pen and just wipe out two, 300 administrative jobs. The place will, would, would hum, it work better because we don't have as, now we only have to go through two layers of bureaucracy to get something done instead of four. And it would, it would hum, and we'd, I'd, I'd save 20 million bucks, which, you know, not chicken feed in my little school, $1,000 a student. Uh, and uh, I, th th that's true at most schools. This will be our final question. I, I have another question about one of the other uh, things that you referred to early in your presentation. When you said that you've studied the states and found a correlation uh, in those states where there's a high uh, percentage of college grads uh, with a, a uh, greater uh, disproportionate uh, economic uh, achievement. Can you give us a little background to that? Because what went through my mind, the first question is, is because the high number of people who are graduates of college are making all the money, and the people who didn't go to college aren't making money as a possibility. 
That's an excellent question. And by the way, this is research that's still ongoing. It's, I've been working on it for the last couple months. It's, it's pretty well documented, and we're getting good statistical results. I'm still, in my own mind, trying to figure out why this is so. And I think you're asking an excellent question. Where you, the, there does, to see, for example, New York is a state with enormous income inequality as measured by standard statistics, but it also has very high percentage of uh, college attainment. But it also has Wall Street. <clears throat> it also has a lot of 10 and $20 million a year people which when you do the statistical calculations of inequality tend to raise uh, that, those statistics a lot. And I'm try, and I wanna try, I'm, I was, I'm a little premature in making the statement I did, I think it's true, uh, actually it's true, but I don't have a complete handle on why. And I wanna, that's the next stage of my research is to try to look at what other characteristics are there in these areas where you have high college attainment, you have a high inequality, uh, what else is going on in those states? And I'm still in the process of doing that. I think you hit on part of it is that college graduates, incomes get skewed, some of them get skewed upwards. And anytime you have Oprah Winfrey in your sample or uh, Tim Tebow or uh, uh, Zuckerberg, oh, oh, he didn't go to, you know, a lot of these, <laughs> Yeah, he went to college. A lot of them, you know, Gates and all these. Gates is trying to get everyone to go to college, even though he didn't himself. I mean, he did, but he didn't graduate. Uh, it's sort of the, the irony of the non-college graduate who's pushing college graduations, one of the kind of funny things, ironic things. I've enjoyed being here very much, uh, and I want to thank you. Am I, is, am, I, am I doing the right thing here? Uh, uh, I want to thank you for coming and I want to thank Hillsdale College, one of the really premier uh, educational institutions in our country, one of the unique educational institutions in our country for inviting me. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Vetter. Uh, that was uh, most enlightening and uh, goes to show that uh, economics is not the dismal science. Uh, it is uh, just after exam time at, at Hillsdale College, our commencement is Saturday, and your reference to uh, the falling standards of final uh, exams and courses in general reminds me of uh, uh, my favorite entry in a blue book, and that was uh, a student attempting to quote Madison's famous quotation, Men are not angels, wrote instead, men are not angles. <laughs> I understood what they meant. Uh, we'll now have lunch and uh, invite you all to uh, go downstairs. There's an elevator. There are also stairs downstairs. It's a lovely day outside. Uh, we'd invite you to join us on the terrace or anywhere else in the building that you would like to eat. Uh, I should mention two upcoming events on the month of June. Uh, this lecture series uh, will, uh, as with today and also our next time and, and probably in, in times thereafter, depart from the first Friday. Uh, we, we try to keep it uh, to, uh, to that time frame and, and may do so in the future, but uh, our next talk actually falls on a Monday, Monday, June the 4th. We'll uh, have a talk from Gretchen Morganson. A former editor at uh, Forbes and, and Worth magazine, uh, Ms. Morganson now uh, writes uh, for the New York Times and covers Wall Street. Her topic uh, is the 2008 uh, housing crisis and the lack of accountability for that thing. She's written a book, uh, Reckless Endangerment, to that subject and will be summarizing some of her more recent thoughts on that uh, uh, important topic. Uh, in the latter part of that week then, we welcome uh, each summer, a group of Hillsdale College students. Uh, for 40 years, we've been sending our undergrads uh, to Washington, and on Friday, June 8th, we'll welcome our incoming class of Washington Hillsdale Internship Program participants. Uh, so about 35, 40 Hillsdale College students will be coming. Uh, and uh, to, to welcome them, we're going to have a talk uh, with the title of, Why is Thomas More the Patron of Politicians? So that's the kind of thing that blends their studies and what we do here at the Kirby Center, we think. We'll also be uh, pleased to have the, the, the giver of that presentation, Stephen Smith, a scholar of Shakespeare, who might uh, want to talk to you about Professor Vetter. Uh, 
he, he teaches Dante and Thomas More and has done some really wonderful recent work on, on uh, Thomas More, and so we'll be uh, giving that presentation. It's going to uh, be kind of a, uh, a, a convivial time, so there'll be refreshments and food that evening, Friday, uh, uh, June the 8th. So then, uh, please join us for lunch. Thank you very much for coming today. <laughs>